I think uh, let me get started then and I'll uh, continue from where I left off. Um, so, I recall that uh, we started hardness of CI testing. Uh, this is the paper of hardness of CI testing and a generalized covariance measure by Sean Peters. I started talking about it. I'll quickly summarize, I'll repeat what I said yesterday just to get uh, so that we, we again have the same notation and then we'll talk about the results. Um, so, XYZ is a triplet of continuous random variables and um, such that they actually have a PDF. <coughs> um, so that's what I mean by, uh, they mean by absolute continuous with respect to Clever equation. So R is a set of all triplet joint distributions. Again, here X, Y, and Z be vectors, even though it's just written as scale, it, the notation, it, it doesn't matter. It can be a finite dimensional vector or a scale. And E, e zero M, are the set of distributions whose support are minus m n. So it's finite. Um, and the problem is the following. I there's a family of distribution yeah, among these distributions, this family of distributions, there are some that have the conditional independence uh, property uh, be, uh, between x and y condition on z and others that don't. And so P0 is a set of all distributions. P such that X and Y are conditional independent with Z. And Q0 is a set of all distributions such that X and Y are not conditional dependent with Z. Setting. And from this large collection, I can look at the restriction of those conditionally independent distributions that are supported finitely on minus M. That is what P0M is. And Q0M, they correspond to ones which are not conditionally independent. So, now, the hypothesis, composite hypothesis testing problem we want to solve is the following that the null hypothesis is that some distribution P is picked from this collection of, uh, of condition independent distributions with finite support, uh, such meaning X and Y are condition independent under Z for that P that is chosen. And under the alternative hypothesis, a Q has been picked from the other class such that X and Y are not condition independent. With the selected single distribution, NIAD samples are generated, X, I, Y, I, Z, I. And the goal is to find a test of which could be randomized, meaning you could use independent randomness, independent of any of these things. Uh, but given this, that from these samples, it returns zero or one, zero meaning null hypothesis, or one being the alternate. So that is the goal. So, as I said last time, there are two things which we need to think about the level and the power of the test. The level of the test is about the under the null hypothesis, what the probability test is wrong. So, more formally, so suppose the underlying hypothesis is H0, meaning some P in the class P0, uh, P0M is chosen. And then the test which you provide, uh, phi n, um, it's a function of the samples and it returns one. So, what's the probability that it returns one? Under this distribution. So, you, this one basically means it's saying it is not conditionally independent. So, this is basically an error. Okay? And so, this is nothing but the probability that your test gets things wrong and with this distribution. <laughs> and clear, so, for any fixed P, you want this to be small, right? Ideally, zero. What we are asking for is by level is the worst case. So, look over all possible P. E, you want this to be small for every single thing uniform. So this primum or all that is level. And power is the other side. So this is under the active hypothesis of each one. So suppose that Q has been chosen, which means X and Y are not condition independent given. See? And now you are asking that it correctly determines that. So phi n is one means it correctly determines that Q is indeed doesn't have the condition independence property. So you want this to be as high as possible. And the power of the test is that it should be high, as high as possible for all possible inputs. So the level is alpha and the power is beta. So you want level to be close to, you want this to be close to zero, you want this to be close to. One. This is what you would like. So let's first state the two hardness theorems from their paper. And, uh, and then we'll talk about an example to see what is going on. So if you give any, for any n, any alpha, so whatever 
the level you want and whatever your support is m which is greater than zero and you give any randomized test tn then the theorem states that suppose that the level is less than alpha that's what this is saying suppose the level is less than alpha then it says for any q the power is also less than alpha so this is a strong result saying that it is impossible to find a, a, a uh, condition independence test that can have low level of high power in a general setting. So we haven't made any the key thing is there are no assumptions on the distribution, right? It's just saying but in, it, it just finite support but nothing else. Nothing about how smooth it is or any such thing. Yes. I know you're not going to do proof, but uh, is there intuition? Yes, that? I'm going to do it. That's exactly what I want to do. I don't want to do the proof, I want to do the intuition. That's uh, that's it. That's what I'll spend the next 15 minutes on. Another related question, M why do you want to fix M and not look at arbitrary distributions? For any M, it's close. You could, you could pick arbitrary. It doesn't matter. This is this is special. Your question is answered here. It doesn't matter whether M is fixed. Fine. Oh, it can be infinity. Yes. That's why I put that. Maybe in some scenarios we are not interested in supremum and infimum. If we have expected, let's say, do you think that's a value instead of let's? What do you mean? Expected meaning? So that we if redefine power and level let's say instead of supremum over all p i'm guessing because of supremum that's making it mess there always is a worst case so what we'll do is demonstrate so again it's not clear see whenever you say you say you're having some distribution over p but that's a generative model you need some other so what you're going to other assumptions are good enough to what we'll show is we can actually do it with smoothness okay so you're saying if you restrict the collection of p's and Q's is something possible. I, I'll interpret your question that way. Yeah. And the answer is yes. Okay. But first I want to start start with no restrictions and then say what kind of restrictions are used. Because I want to talk about useful tests next. The second is a total variation distance. So let me spend a little bit of time on total variation. So the total variation distance between two distributions is the following. Pick a set B. Uh, I'll pick a set A. Okay. Yeah, so I have a set A. And the, the first distribution, B, asks what is the probability that the triplet lies in that set A? So, this, what is this? If it's continuous, it's the integral over of this joint distribution over the set A. Joint PDF over the set A. That's all this is. And again, under Q, you ask the same question. What's the probability? Um, whoa, whoa, that the triplet lies in the setting. Okay. So this is some measure for a fixed A, this is some measure of how different P and Q are. Right? Um, in particular for every single A, if they are the same, then the distributions are the same. But uh, what, I, what I mean by every single A is all moral measurables, all moral So the total variation distance is the worst case over all A of this matrix. That's called the total variation distance. That uh, yeah, what the theorem says. So theorem two says the following: fix M. Then there is a Q. There is a distribution such that this distribution is far away from every Q. Far away meaning at least one by two. Wanted me to talk about this once more. So, is this clear now? The statement. So, there is a distribution that is far away from everything, meaning, in, and in particular, therefore, there is no P satisfying X and Y conditional uh, condition dependent on Z because P is uh, P is P is at this form that is close in total radiation distance to some space. There's a key. However, but any Q, including the one constructed above, that's the first theorem. Because there's a the CI testing does not have any reasonable power. So these pair of statements are interesting. Right? Uh, so somehow this implication of this pair of results is that you need to somehow restrict the set of P's and Q's if you have to, if you hope to have 
uh, small power, a uh, small level are high power. So essentially, this is saying that uh, you are somehow well separated, but still you can't separate it in terms of TV distance. Uh -huh. So maybe TV distance is a wrong way to even think about these things. That is the other thing. That, that's the takeaway. And we will see why. After they, so it, there are many notions of well separated. And when we think of distance between distribution, we don't care, right? We go from one to the other. This is saying that TV distance is not really capturing the issue. That's that's one takeaway from it. <laughs> so once we go through it, instead of giving a proof, as you asked, I, I want to show an example which gives the intu intuition for their thing. And this example lies at the heart of the group. You need to do much more work based on, they need to, they have done much more work based on this example. But this example sort of captures uh, what is going on. Okay. So this again, this example is adapted from their paper. X, Y, and Z is a scalar triplet over minus one, one, two. So it's scalar. Now, the example is just x comma y comma z, all scalar, all between minus one and one. Okay. Support. So it's it's on a U, it's a right. It's, it's it's very simple to think about this. First, we construct a Q such so for, furthermore, x, y, and z, the marginals are uniform between minus one. I'm not talking about joints, just the marginal of x, y, and z is uniform between minus one and one. So it's essentially, I'm just thinking of the unit box uh, between minus one. First, so now we'll construct a queue. That's that X and Y are not conditionally independent given Z. Z is, in, is chosen to be, is a, you construct a uniform between minus one and one randomly. So it's just this distribution person. Z. So Z distribution. And Z is independent of X comma Y. And now how is X and Y constructed? X and Y are co are, have a joint distribution. They are not independent. They are uniform over 0, 1 square, union minus 1, 0 square. So let's draw a picture. So th this is my X axis, Y axis, Z axis. Okay. Z is uniform between minus 1, 1. That's there. X and Y, if you look at the top view, as is only here. If you look from the top, that's what this picture is saying. Okay. Top view of x comma, this is the xy plane. So this is what the joint distribution is. Meaning x, x and y are uniform here or uniform here. This is here what x and y joint distribution is. So the three-dimensional joint distribution is looking like because along the z-axis, it's uniform. X and Y is these two squares, and it just goes down. Here so far. So, first of all, let's look at the top view. It should be fairly obvious, and we can do this calculation. You see that X and Y, uh, that, sorry, that top view. I should just do Y. So. To be fairly obvious looking at this picture that X and Y are not independent. They have a strong dependency. Meaning, if you know X is positive, you know Y is your I is uniform on this one. If you know X is negative, if you know that X is negative, then Y is uniform here. The support itself completely changes given the sign of X. That's the first observation. The second observation is that if you know the sign of X, there's nothing more you can learn about Y. We'll use that property later, but this is actually very important. Even the, if you act, if, so let me repeat that sentence. If I happen to know the sign of X, meaning I know it's positive, then what can you tell about Y? Whether X is here or X is here doesn't matter. The, the distribution of Y looks exactly the same wherever you are on the uh, R for whatever value of X positive. Similarly, for whatever value of X negative, the distribution of Y looks identical. It's, you know, it's uniform between. Very specifically, if X is positive, then Y is uniform between 0 and 1. If X condition, condition, condition on it. If X is negative, uh, the 
the sine of x, uh, sine of x is negative, then y is uniform between 0 and minus 1. So, one bit encodes the dependence between x and y. But if I don't give that sign, then they're very strongly correlated. In fact, uh, the correlate, you can do the calculation. I think the correlation coefficient is uh, do the calculations on it. <laughs> okay, we can calculate it. Okay, it is this It's one. I, uh, it is. You can just check that the correlation. If there's uh, um, yeah, x and y are zero mean. Y is z also zero mean. You just check this. You'll get that the covariance is one. You can actually explicitly compute this. And so clearly x and y are not but that is clear even from all our description right so note here x and y are not independent whether they're conditioned on z or not doesn't matter z is independent of x and y okay so what we have constructed is x and y such that x is not independent of y and z which is independent of x x and y and therefore trivially x is not condition independent of y given z are you good with this how did you calculate uh, covariance? Um, how did I calculate covariance? Uh, use the formula expected value of uh, x times y minus expected value of x times expected value of y by you know the joint distribution, do the integral. It's, 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 you, you do the calculation. Okay. Roughly, why should the covariance be one quarter? When x, so let's look at the expected value of x times y. Okay. I look at two cases condition that x is greater than zero times probability x greater than zero plus that condition x less than or equal to zero times probability x less than or equal to zero. The probability of x greater than zero and less than or equal to zero is each half. Now I want to look at e of x y given x greater than zero. Okay. Um, and then condition on x greater than zero, um, then you can actually write the distribution. Then you know that you are in the upper, the joint distribution is in the upper side. Do the calculation and you can get this. That's all. It's, just you can work this out properly. It doesn't matter that it's one fold. All I want to argue is it's not equal to zero. So are you fine with this example so far? X and Y are, condi are conditionally independent. X and Y are unconditionally independent and also conditionally independent in this case because Z is independent of X comma Y. Good so far? No, not good. They are the um, I kind of lost you at the very beginning where I was not able to understand why we are missing on the second and the fourth quadrants. Oh, this is my joint. Okay, good. Yeah. That's my joint distribution is the following. It's a joint distribution is three dimensional, right? So if it is some part of the unit cube is should be the joint distribution. Joint distribution if x, y, and z are all between minus one one, then it, the joint distribution should lie somewhere, somewhere in the unit cube. cube. Yeah. Now we are doing the following. We are doing this construction. First I, we need to construct a joint f x y. This is what we are trying to define what this function is. Okay. First, we are going to define it in the following way. So, we need x and y are independent of z. Okay. Okay. That means z is uniform between minus 1 and 1. Which means what? Along this axis, the joint of x and y won't matter. It shouldn't change. It should, it should look change. exactly the same. And Okay. So it should look exactly the same, whatever slice you take, the joint of x and y. Yeah. That's property. Yeah. Now let's look at joint of x and y. We are constructing the joint of x and y such that the joint of x and y looks like this. Okay, we, we are constructing it. Yeah, this is our construction. This, okay. there, I'm not saying anything about it. This has to be it. This is an x. Okay. I am giving you a joint distribution x and y, x, y, and z that looks like this. That only lies in the first and the third quadrant. Exactly. Okay. This is my choice. I'm telling you this is my x, y, z. If this is my joint distribution, and I'm going to call this joint distribution. Are you with me so far? Yeah, the X, the joint of X and Y is the Q here. Joint of X, Y, and Z is the Q. Okay, joint of X, Y, and Z, the, the triplet is the triplet is Q. Okay. And the doublet of X and Y looks like this. Yeah. And when you compose it together with the Z, because Z is uni independent, it looks like this. So now you get two cuboids, which are like this, is the three-dimensional joint distribution. That's the quadrant, quadrant of this. Is it? And in this case, you see by construction, x is not independent of y. Oh, x is not independent of y. Yeah. That is clear. Yeah. And also, x comma y is independent of z. Yeah. 
because the joint is same at, at, at any level of exactly you take any slice on any plane slice they look exactly this fine so therefore therefore x is this is also true uh, x is not independent of y given here like whether you given z or not doesn't matter so now this is my huh. so both statements are true x is not independent of y anyways and x is also not independent of y given z right okay so this is true this is true and these both are true yeah that's that's basically right. and it's also this the yeah. statement is also true it's also that right. right. yeah. this is also true yeah. okay. now we are going to so this was the the base construction now we are going to perturb this construction such that we'll get the goal now, I, I'll tell you because we are doing something interesting here. What we are going to do is to make some small change to this such that we have this following. Okay. 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 We are going to change this example a little bit to get X and Y conditional in parent events. Okay. That is the next part. Okay. And this is the So I, I want to make sure you understand where I'm going with this. Now, so to do that, we'll we construct a new random variable Z tilde. It's a function of x and z. It has nothing to do with y. We are going to construct a fourth random variable z tilde. And the construction is the following. Z is between minus and 1. So how can I can represent it as a sign plus minus 0 point a binary expansion. For example, if z happened to be 0.5, it would be 0 0.100000. If z is 38, it would be uh, 0. 0 0.101000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? Are you with me? So I'm just looking at the binary representation of that number between 0 and 1. This sign could be between positive or negative. Fine. Now consider binary expansion of Z. In the nth bit, whatever your favorite M is, 100th bit. Delete the value, whatever that expansion value is, and replace it by 0 if X happens to be non negative. And replace it by one if x is negative. So we are making it correlated with x. Yes. Z tilde encodes z tilde is not exactly z, but it noiselessly encodes x now. Because in the nth bit, it tells you exactly what x, it noiselessly encodes the sign of the x. Not the rest of it, just the sign of x is encoded noiselessly in z, z tilde. Is that clear? Also, one more thing, as m becomes really, really large, it doesn't matter. It still noiselessly encodes it for whatever value of m. So, so the, the, the value of m will be known, right? It, it doesn't. That's, that's the issue. I'm not going to... Uh, we'll worry about that in a second. Okay, okay. I'm just giving you a construction. But the construction, of course, it is known. You are designing this. So, pick an m, you're constructing this. So, if m is in the millionth bit, what is the distance sample wise between z and z tilde? Very small. Yeah. So if I give you the value, okay, it is very, very hard to determine whether it's z or z tilde. I give you a number, uh, uh, I'll pull a sample, I draw a sample. It's hard to figure out whether the sample was from z or from z tilde. Agree? Because there, I can make it vanishingly small, such as from any, even if you have a million samples, uh, and ask you, is this sample's distribution from Z, or is, are these million samples from Z till that? It's really hard to say, because I'll put them in the billionth bit. Okay, are you with me? Good. So, but now what happens? So, what is, so just to complete the story, I'll give you an example. ZI, suppose this was the value, okay, and this is the end of it. This means ZI was approximately one quarter plus one by 32 plus whatever. So it's 0 0.2812 something. And then in the nth bit, ZI tilde is either zero or one, depending on the sign of X. So now consider this quadruplet XYZ. Choose M to be large, then for every, for samples, these things are sample wise very, very large. Okay. Basically, the error between the samples is one by two. From samples, it's very hard to distinguish between these two triplets. If I give you x, y, z, if I tell you, 
Tell me which which model used to generate the sample. Is it MM XYZ or XYZ tilde? It's very hard for you to figure out. Because the samples are so close to you. And I can make it arbitrarily hard by putting M to the billion billionth bit. Okay. But in the above in the above construction also encodes a sign of X noiseless in Z tilde. Meaning, once you know its sign, X and Y are condition dependent given Z tilde. Okay, because there is no more dependent, it tells you the quadrant and you are done. But X and Y are not conditioned. X. You have these two now. Okay, <laughs> this is what we call P. This is our Q we started with. You know what I mean? So now let P be X, Y, Z tilde, Q be X, Y, Z. So first, you're saying that these, these are so close, but the total variation distance is very far. Why? I'll use my Borel set to be such that it only focuses on the mth bit. Remember, I needed to find S set A. I've, what is my total variation distance? Yes. It is such or all sets to distinct, make this as large as possible. My set will focus on some part of X and some part of Y space in that region. And for the Z, in the Z direction, I'll just focus on that set, which for, you know, the F, it's some weird set, right? If I look at the, where the nth bit, in the bi, I can look at it in the binary space and that focus only on the nth bit. I mean, there's a constant probability that Z and Z tend will be different. Essentially, if they're uniform, is pro, or, I think probability half, or all of that, some constant probability. Because one of them was, because any if z is in a uniform, a, they are, a, every I think uh, level is plus minus half uh, or uh, uh, zero, zero one every value, and so uh, I just now force it based on x with some independent uniform. So uh, this the sign is half. So I've basically got a constant probability. So the total variation distance between p and q is large in this example. I'll get to you in a second. The total variation distance between x and p and q is constant, independent of M, because the Borel set doesn't, I search for all possible. So whatever value of M you use, it's, it's the same. I will just use a different Borel set. However, I have this, one is condition dependent, other isn't. And, and you can see intuitively now from samples, there is no way I'm going to separate between these two. Because X, Y, and Z sample, whether it's Z or Z tilde, it's important. It is extremely hard to figure this out. We need so many samples to actually find the, uh, essentially it's true to the one by two to the M is a level of difference. The noise, you need your concentrations to go below that if you want to figure something out. And I will make M larger and larger and because I can use anything I want in this thing. So whatever number of samples you have, there's some pair in P and Q, which is going to be bad. Okay. And that's, this is, this is not a proof. But this is telling you essentially what the issue is. What now you can see why this proof is their proof. Their proof actually uses more complicated construction because they have even the properties we talked about even stronger than this. But this gets to the heart of the issue. Now you had a question. Yeah, so uh, I I can understand follow to the point where uh, why Z and Z tilde are inseparable, uh, especially I mean we can we have the freedom to choose. M as large, so that that makes sense. But uh, I was not able to follow the argument at the B, where how, how did we get X is independent of Y given Z tilde? That's something I'm not yet following. Why is X and Y independent given Z tilde? Yeah. Suppose I know Z tilde. So I told you this model is from Z tilde. So I go to the nth bit, and then because I given you Z tilde, I go to the nth bit and look at it. It the gives me the sign. Yeah. It tells me the sign of X. Yeah. Okay. Then why? What what uh, more is there to be known about y? Okay, yeah. One set so whatever I know about y from x is basically due to the sign of x. So I know so one of bit or one bit is a real relation. I have there's an encoding of the one bit. Is it clear? They can, so this is I think this idea is at the heart of it. They use this in more sophisticated so, so ways. Essentially, what we are saying here is that by just smartly varying z to z tilde by just using that one bit. We are able to induce the conditional independence between X and Y. That's right. You want to essentially have, so stepping back, what do you want? You want to perturb Z slightly such that Z and Z tilde, in one case, X and Y are condition dependent. In the other case, it isn't. Okay. 
And furthermore, Z and Z tilde are really far away in some think of notion of distance we think about. Okay. And both are true here. So, uh, can, can you elaborate on the part how Z and Z tilde are far away? Okay. So you would, as you would say, hey, it's just one little bit in the yeah, standard uh, Euclidean is. distance because I'll go back from binary to real, the real thing. The samples are extremely close. Yeah. But now we, you need to understand what total variation distance is. Saying it's searching over all sets. I will search over sets which focus only on the empty bit. Okay. I will blank out everything else. And in which case, in that set, okay, they're true. very, very far away. Okay. But in one far they can get. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. And so that's it. Okay. So it's saying that total variation is not the right way to think of. I mean, this is far in total variation, but they're close in some other distance. Okay. Really, the problem is okay. so what do you need to fix it? We'll get to how to deal with this. But is it clear now why they, they, these are the pathological type of examples because with CI testing it's not? So this example, one more point. Crucially relies on Z being continuous. It's discrete, all this will go, this problem will go. This is a really an issue of, I cannot do this encoding. X and Y can be discrete or continuous, it doesn't matter. But Z being continuous is actually crucial for the reasons. Question. So like, uh, how do, how will you show that uh, Z and uh, Z tilde are far away, like what exact set? Like, uh, it's, is the model set focusing on the binary expansion of the number, focusing only on the nth? Look at all the numbers where the mth bit is one. Look at all the numbers where mth bit is zero. Those are the two sets. It's a problem of TV sets. <laughs> TV, <laughs> but you have done to TV all the time. Total variation is a standard. This is just pretty distributed. All okay. the definitions of suprema and infima. I guess fastest and distance will be zero in this case because, like, the put them in. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, given you, whether it's, but irrespective of whether TV is far or near, C it's hard because we are given, it's not smooth, this is not a smooth change. This, 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 this change from conditional dependence to conditional independence is not smooth in, in, in these cases. That's really the problem. Okay. And this is because Z is continuous and variable, small perturbations in Z can switch you from conditional dependence to independence. Okay. All right. In fact, uh, if you, there's, uh, there's a lot of discussion. Another nice paper, which I've cited here, but I'm not going to talk about is by Nekov, Palakrishnan, and Wasserman. Uh, basically, where they sort of talk about how to, you need to control. Essentially, the issue is to control the smoothness of P of X, Y, given Z. That's really what is needed to actually come up with positive results. Okay. And in fact, in previous work, before, so we were looking for CI tests um, in, a, in a paper with uh, Sen, Suresh, uh, so, uh, Rajat Sen, Anantita Suresh, Kartikeyan, uh, Tanugam, Alex Dimakis and me. We, we had, this is in Europe's 2017. So we wanted to develop tests and we had to impose some conditions to actually give guarantees. And now in retrospect, those conditions are some form of smoothness conditions. I'll talk about the test. But uh, so now it's clear why these kinds of conditions are there. The kinds of conditions you would want are the following. Under the alternate hypothesis, okay, um, I'm, I'm not, this is an informal statement now, so this is a remark. Things like this, speed, it would be look at Q, uh, the joint distribution of X and Y under Z versus Z prime in total variation distance. Now we can go back to total, we have scan smoothness, so TV is something you can deal with. In small perturbations in Z will lead to small perturbations in this, if there's some Lipschitz constant. Or um, uh, furthermore, at this under the alternative hypothesis. And the null hypothesis, you want similar thing because they're independent. The joint distribution, it's, it's product form. So for each conditional marginal, you have to have something like this. Okay. Um, this I'm putting L2 distance here, but it doesn't matter. Normal equivalence will move from one to another. And this all could be dimension dependent. So uh, I know Abhishek has been thinking about dimension independent things, but yeah. Uh, oh, but this is all smoothness game. Now you can start thinking about other issues, okay, about how the dependence is. But in any case, you see that some sort of smoothness control is needed, and that is going to pop up somewhere in your guarantees. Okay. And how these constants are depends what kind of structures, how clever you are is a different game. Right? But 
It just says that you move without this your host essentially. So yeah, this is the paper by Nick of uh, Malakrishnan Wasserman, uh, minima, Minimax Optimal Conditional Independence Testing. And this was the paper I sort of alluded to model power condition. All right, so that is, this is as far as the negative results are concerned. Now let me switch to three classes. I'm, this is by no means exhaustive. And honestly, I ran out of steam by the end of these notes. So I wanted to have more classes as well, but uh, I have put three and I have put reference to some other papers, which be good to read and sometimes good for me to write up. I just haven't gotten it. That's the caveat. But I will talk about three sort of popular class, popular ways of thinking about it. And again, this is not the, these papers are not the last word in any of these classes. I just pick three, which are, um, for various reasons, I thought these were these show sort of these types of methods. Um, for state of the art, these look on the in the literature. Uh, so the first method is kernel based methods. So, um, so the what I'm going to be talking about goes back to some of the materials been borrowed from this paper by Dowden, uh, partial associative measures and application to qual qualitative re regression from biometric and 1980. And the, kit, the kernel based CI test, which I'm going to talk about, is Kunzain, Jan Peters, Jan Zing, and Shah Sholkov in UAE 2011. That's KCIT, kernel based condition dependence test, um, which also builds this, it builds on the seeds of it. But most of the time, I'm going to talk about this. Warm up. Before we do any of these things, let's start with our favorite joint Gaussians, three joint Gaussians. Let's do calculations by hand, see what's going on. And then we'll build up the machine. You know that for Gaussians, X and Y are just jointly Gaussian. Forget about even condition. You know that, let's say there's zero mean. I, without loss of generality, I'll just think about zero mean. I'll even set the variance as well. Doesn't matter. Because I don't need then. Then for me, covariance, correlation, everything becomes the same. I don't need to worry about it. So I can misuse all these terms with no problem. X and Y, you know, are independent, but go, joint graph for X, if X and Y are jointly Gaussian, then X and Y are independent if and only if they are uncorrelated. Meaning if the expected value of X times Y is zero, if and only if X is conditioned, X is independent. This is known for Gaussians. Yeah. Um, why? You write out the joint distribution, you know, you, you can, you, Right? Yeah, you can you can see that if the covariance is zero, if the covariance is zero, the distribution facts. Just first principle, your undergrad class, you see. What is not taught in an undergrad class, at least at UT, uh, maybe it's taught in other places, uh, but is that a similar kind of test holds even for conditional independence or Gaussians, joint Gaussians. Okay. Suppose X, Y, and Z are X and Y, suppose you claim that X and Y are conditional independent Q and Z. This is if and only if true, if something called a partial correlation coefficient is zero. Oh, I'm just curious, how many of you have seen partial correlation coefficients in this? Okay, not too many people, one person. Okay, good. Then I'm glad this is, this is useful then. It's just, this is elementary again, but it's something that's not commonly known. So, X and Y are conditionally independent given Z. If, if and only if, first, something called the residue, uh, the residuals are independent, which is if and only if the partial correlation coefficients. So what are these objects? Look at it. The residual of xz is nothing but x minus expected value of x given z. The residual of yz is y minus expected value of y given z. The qualitative interpretation of these residuals is that look at x, y, and z. They are jointly Gaussian. Suppose you say, I'll ask you this following different problem. Okay. Forget about Y. What X and this Z? There's some dependence between them. How will you make them independent? Okay. What, how, this is not a well-worded question. What, how, what can you do to X? How much effect of Z is in X? Well, it's right. Gaussian, right? Basically, I'll do a linear prediction. I will take Z. I will do a, I will do the least squares prediction. This is all Gaussian. So least square, I can just do a least squares prediction. Uh, I'll least predict X, X hat, let's call it X hat, based on Z. 
which means the conditional expectation of x given c, that's the least cost prediction. And then x minus x hat is the residual, meaning what is left over in x after you have subtracted the effect of c. I think this, that's the same as adjustment. Exactly. That's, we are adjusting here. But I'm just using statistical language. Okay. We are saying the same thing. We'll see it in adjustment in just, down, in just a minute. We'll see it as adjustment. Okay. But this is called the residue. I, I'm just, that's why I, I, I'm avoiding today in, in some sense it's very related to what we are talking about before, but it's sort of like a standalone discussion, what I'm talking about. So this is called the residual of x. x. This is nothing but x minus x hat, where x hat is the least cost prediction of x. Similarly, I can get the residual of y. So it's intuitively plausible that if you remove the, if you look at this, uh, this residuals, okay, then all the dependent, because z was the one which was affecting both x, you want to check for conditional independence of x and y given z. So presumably this basically means z is some parent in our directed graph and x and y are two children of it. Okay? And the dependence is going through because of the z. So one way I can figure this out is if I, I can look at this, I can look at the z and predict x, look at the z, predict y, and look at what's left over. That those things must be independent. And that so conditional independence of res, residuals, it seems reason plausible to say that that basically means x and y are condition independent given z. So you have, you have moved a, a conditional independence question to an independence question. And once you have an independence question, and presumably, that, not just presumably, these things are linear because they are all Gaussian. Conditional expectations are all linear uh, for, Ga for, Gaussian, for Gaussians. And linear transformations of Gaussians are still Gaussians. So we still have Gaussians. And therefore, correlations are good enough to test for independence. And so that's basically the logic. Uh, you have a question? Shouldn't we also be adding here that there is no link between x and y? Like, z was the parent between or Yeah, but, but it's not, this is not. This is if and only if. I'm assuming, I want to argue this implies this, this. That's all. So what you're saying is automatically built into the statement. Okay. If it is, you can't do that. And that's why it's an if and only statement. Okay. Um, it, it, it's clear, right? What this thing is. So let's actually work this out. I, I've basically told you everything I'm going to say for the next five minutes, but uh, I'll just do this more concretely. So X and Y are independent for joint Gaussians, if and only if co correlation coefficient, which is the co covariance divided by the square root of the covariance is zero. That's your definition. That, that's, that's where we start from. What is the partial correlation coefficient? The partial correlation coefficient is the following. We are going to assume without loss of generality that all random variables are zero. Mean. Otherwise, we need to do, deal with centered versions of them. Okay. So let A be the best least squares predictor of uh, x parent from z. So meaning alpha is your least square uh, the coefficient. Um, and b be the best least square predictor of y starting from z. So, so you can see now the connection to exactly your adjustments. Meaning because x and y each separately on z and x hat and y hat are the predictors. Indeed, if this was the true graphical model. Okay, then these least square sol solving this will recover this. That's what we, we did this calculation even on the first day. And then define Rxz and Ryz as the residuals of x uh, minus the x hat and y minus y hat. And define the partial correlation coefficient as the correlation coefficient between the residuals. So this is denoted as xy dot z. That's the English. And this is the covariance of this. Uh, and the theorem is that uh, the statement is that this if and only if. To see why. Okay. You can actually compute things out explicitly. Okay. Let's let's look at this case where it is truly easy. X and Y are truly condition independent given. This is from our I can just use the adjustment model and show this is what is happening. So this is your model. And when you do the least squares, okay, in this first of all, it is clear X and Y are conditionally independent given Z because Z is a decent. Yeah, it is conditional from everything you have talked about. Yeah, I, I condition on this, it's be separated. So in this case, now to compute this, you can check X hat, the best least square predictor in indeed AZ. Y hat is indeed B times Z. 
And so the residuals are x minus a z and y minus b z. So let's compute the x. They're zero mean because x and z are all zero mean. Let's compute the regression, uh, the, the, the product of these two. If you just write, expand this and write this out, we'll actually get zero. And to check the other way around, to check the other way around, if you indeed put a C this way or you put a C that way, um, you can check that this is not. I haven't done that. But you can just explicitly do this kind of thing. So the summary is that, and you can do this with more covariance. If C is a vector, you can see that nothing will really change. And thus, takeaway is there is this for joint Gaussian, there's a very easy way of checking for conditional kind of variance. Just using uh, partial coordinates. So, some, yesterday people were asking after class what happens if there's more structure. So, joint goes in, you see, there are much better ways of doing these kind of things. These things get tricky when you have, when you want to do non parametric Parametric, the parametric world is very different from non parametric. Furthermore, if the joint, if the random variables are not jointly governed, we cannot relate partial correlation to a coefficient in either direction. Okay, you can't go one way or the other. And you can read the text 7.9 for an example for going both. So all right. So this Even brings me to other parametric distribution and not caution. I so saw you saw link ups yesterday. So different. So there's a bunch of different yeah. algorithms. I gave you one that's why I gave you one example yesterday for non-parametric. For non-parametric, some structure is there, maybe you can employ that structure and do something. Um, yeah. In either direction, so does, it, does that mean that if the partial correlation is non zero, then you could have? Yeah, there is both ways there are examples. Okay, that's uh, 7.9. Yeah. I, I don't remember the construction offhand. So, but we know that things work for Gaussians. Then, if for anything else, maybe we can do kernel methods and go to kernel space and get things to work. That is kernel tests. That's the whole thing. And we will take that on after the break. Let's stop now, maybe because lunch is here. Or, uh, and uh, not lunch, whatever. Brunch. 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 All right. Um, folks on Zoom, I'm going to mute now for uh, we will get back. I know I stopped a few minutes early, but still, we will start at 11.10 local. Okay, uh, just one quick comment on the example we talked about. Kubita pointed out here that uh, that the example is not still complete because if you know the value of m, then you can distinguish x, y, z from x, y, z tilde. That is true, which is why this is just a plausibility argument. It is not a full argument. The paper actually has to do more constructions. It's also crucial not to know the value of m for this thing to work out. And they do much more. So. Yeah, the point of this example was just to show that small, you can perturb Z just a little bit and change things quite a bit uh, in terms of independent structure. But this is one of the building blocks. There are other building blocks as well. They're hardness proof. So I'd refer you to the paper itself. Thank you. Okay. So let's get back to yes. um, so beyond joint. Uh, so where we left off was partial correlation test or goes joint goes in interference. So that's hopefully clear at this point. What would you do uh, beyond joint Gaussians? So this goes back to a, a paper by Dowden in 1980, a useful characterization of conditional independence. So they so in general, you know that for scalar random variables. Cor correlation is just forget about all. If expected value, right? correlation is expected value, of, let's say zero mean. I am not worried about it. Uh, if, if I make expected value of x times y zero, that's not sufficient for getting independence. But indeed, independence you can get if you have the following. For every pair of functions f and g, if the expected value of f of x times g of y is uh, or is equal to zero, then you can you can show this, right? I mean that. So we know that for independence. If you look over all possible functions in some nice enough class, some square integrable functions, blah, 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 you should be able to do this. So this is the equivalent. 
characterization for conditional independence. So x, y, and z are um, vectors as before. Um, and say x and y are mean square integral. And f tilde and g tilde are some centered versions of that. Okay, so I've uh, I've, I've centered it uh, properly. Then x x and y are conditionally independent given z, if and only if for all square in, uh, if and only if the following is true: f the centered versions f tilde and g tilde are the product expected value of the product is zero for all square integral functions such that the such that some conditional expectation is zero, some centering is. I don't want to go into the details of these things. I'm not trying to do algebra. This is going to be quick and high level so that you see the style of these results. I don't expect you to pass any of these equations in real time. I just want to give you a flavor of these. these things. And there are many other equivalent criteria. So okay, if you have such a criteria, you could operationalize this by searching over all functions in some function class. And one way to operationalize this is go to some RKH, go, go to kernel space, do some RKHS calculations and try to do it. So you can kernel, these kinds of things can be kernelized. That's, that's, that's all I want to say. So there are a bunch of other equivalent criteria, okay? Different types of centerings, different types of... Uh, so X and Y are condition independent given C. This is what we talked about. G tilde and F tilde and G tilde were the centered versions, which we just defined just a second back. But you can deal with some one is centered, one uncentered, um, and various other tests which I don't even really want to get into. But it's just all I want to say is that expected value of products uh, of functions of the random variables, if that is zero, that gives you conditions for condition, testing for conditions. Yes. But if G are trivially constant zero functions. That's an example. No, it needs to be true for all, not for one. You need to test for all possible functions. Okay? Yes, your example is true, it's zero, but that's not good enough. So all the, these, th these things are still not made into tests. They have not been operationalized. Meaning they basically are just a property. If you can give me a certificate saying that for all possible F and G, this property holds, then they're condition dependent. How you use this is a different game. That's what I want to do. I'm just starting you off with, this is an interesting property and we want to use this for conditional independence testing. Okay. Uh, in fact, you will see this style in many case, settings. To find some prop, the general recipe for CI testing is find some asymptotic property. Okay. And then once you have this asymptotic property, operationalize it in some way using a quote unquote efficient test. And then do a p-test on that test statistics you're going to construct. This is sort of the formula for CI testing, building a CI test. So we, we'll, I want to give you a demonstration of this sort of formula in a few cases. That's basic my goal. Um, again, this this summary is not going to be enough for you to actually follow. I don't even expect you to follow this. I wouldn't be able to follow what I'm going to say next. Um, it's just I want to give you a flavor of what is happening. Uh, that's that's all I'm I'm trying to get across at this point. So we want to oper operationalize one of these various forms. So uh, the, the form which is being operationalized here is this one. So F tilde is as before and G tilde prime is um, some other, uh, some centered form of square integrable functions. That's, that's what we want to operate. And so this is the KCIT, which is actually one of the mainstream and powerful classes of testers people actually use. So that's why. And as I said, this is from uh, the paper by uh, uh, this is the UAA paper, right? Yeah. Uh, this is 2011. Let me see the reference again. It's this paper. Kernel based condition dependence application because of it. That's what I meant. So, X, Y, and Z are some vector value random variables. Kx is some positive definite kernel over some reproducing kernel Hilbert space, Hx, and there are analog, analogous kernels Ky and Kz. So we, this kernel is characteristic in the following sense. A kernel is said to be characteristic if the following property is true. Um, the expected for all functions in this function class, 
suppose that the expected value of f of x is equal to the expected value of uh, uh, f of x under either one of these two distributions, then that implies the distribution is the same. So it's rich enough, this, this function class is rich enough to actually um, say something about equivalence of the underlying distribution. So that's really what this characteristic kernel means. Um, so that means if you have such a characteristic kernel, then we can use a kernel test for the CI criterion above, which in some spirit, which in spirit generalizes the residue like test we are looking at. That's really the goal. And so this is the KCIT approach. Um, I've written the algebra here. I'm not even sure the point of actually talking through it, but I will. Uh, I, uh, so uh, all that, so you are given samples x1 through xn, y1 through yn, z1 through zn. So you need to first construct a centered sample kernel. There's a way of doing it. Um, the, then you need to do, you need to, yeah, you can do an eigen decomposition. It's a positive definite kernel. Yes. The definition of characteristic kernel, actually the kernel doesn't show. F is in the, uh, no, the kernel has an associated RKHS. And so uh, oh, the RKHS okay, and okay. the kernel go okay. together. Okay. Yeah. So it is buried inside here. Because any function on this can be described in terms of the kernel. Again, I don't want to go down the kernel. I mean, it's stuff you can read offline. So I, I just want to give you sort of very high level here. If you aren't familiar with kernels and RKHS, there are like lots of nice tutorials. I'm just suggesting. But it is there inside you. So all that I'm trying to say is given the data, there are certain sample kernels that can be constructed from your data. Okay. That's what this description here is, all this description. Once you have that, you can, you can construct a test statistic with finite samples. So the test statistic is some, some sample kernels you have created from data and you're taking the trace. So I, I don't even want to get into what these things are, but they can be compute, computed using the data and you can create a test statistic. The important thing is, this is a function of x1 to xn. This is actually a random variable. Yeah. Okay. That's all it is. That's what we call this statistic. And their theorem is the following. That look at this creature as n tends to infinity. And you define some other creature as n tends to infinity. So for each n you create something else. This one is... Um, This thing has a distributional representation um, with, depending on some Gaussians and chi-square distribution. So these are all some known random variables. And the theorem is of the form that this sequence has the same asymptotic distribution as this sequence. What a, I, I don't want to get into the details of what these are, but I want to tell you how this, these tests work out. Work. So what is the point of defining the second sequence? I know how to simulate samples from the second sequence. Remember, what do I have at this point? I have one sample from, so I given x1, x1 through xn, y1 through yn, z1 through zn. This is my sample. Using this, I can calculate this. Thing. That's some number. For my realization, it's one point. As n tends to infinity, I have some distribution of this quantity. And I also have the guarantee that as n tends to infinity, this one's distribution is equal to this one's distribution. So what would I do? How would I operation, operationalize such a test? Well, I just assume n equal to infinity, quote unquote, or n large, and I can simulate this one. I'll generate large number of samples of this one. Okay, these are my simulation samples. I have one sample of this one. I will see where this sample, where this one sample lies in this in the collection of these kinds of samples. And that allows me to do an empirical p test. I can reject it now. You see, the guarantees of this are a very different style, right? It's it's some asymptotic. There is a, the spirit of these tests is there is an asymptotic property, and I know the asymptotic characterization of the distribution of them. This allows me to do p-value tests, but there is no finite sample guarantees, no rates of convergence, none of those kinds of things here, okay? or concentrations, or any other kind of stuff. It's it's an asymptote. It's a property that is efficiently testable. Uh, the, the why they chose 
that particular form of CI test and uh, uh, that particular use of the Dowden's theorem as opposed to something else is all about how well you can characterize these distributions and how some efficiency of these components. But yes. We'll go to the uh, second. The this this equation. What is the sample here in sample simulation? Where is the randomness? I, I don't understand the equation. gamma k. These are IID Gaussian random variables. So is, you can construct Gaussian random variables. And what is the lambda k? Is it learned from data? These are eigenvalues of something. Exactly, eigenvalues of something learned from data. Okay. Yeah. So you can operationalize this test because of that. You sample generate Gaussians. Do something to these Gaussians and you still give me one sample. Generate only a new collection. Only if you do n over infinity. So I'll <laughs> arbitrarily pick n equal to 100. I don't know. I'll pick some n, generate it. I'll get an approximation. Then I do this again and again. I'll get a bunch of samples. And then I have my one sample, my test, and see where it falls and do a test. Right. So it's a, it's a, they, there are multiple cautions here, right? First, this is, all these properties and associated tests are based on population characterizations of CI. These are, and so you can see that usually when we think of, hey, we have a population, usual concentration should hold, and again, we can get churn of bone and give you finite sample again. This is not that style, because there are, uh, there are some two sequences converging distribution, something is happening, I don't have a rate of convergence, and I, I'm using a test based on the equilibrium. So getting finite sample versions of this, it's, it's not at least clear to me what, how you would go about it. It's not sort of the usual machinery. Okay. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, there are no finite sample guarantees. For this. There might be, I just don't. Um, a generic version to break a CI test um, is go back to that. You can break all these things. We saw basic construction earlier. Okay. You can construct small perturbations and break these things. The reason that none of those assumptions actually appear in this, in, when we are stating this theorem, those kinds of continuity assumptions are not there because these are not giving you, finally the way you're operating, it's based on some infinite sample. Theorem is saying something about the infinite sample limit. It's not telling you anything really about the finite sample test. Okay. That is a approximation. And so keep that in mind. <clears throat> But it's a, it, this is a popular class of tests, and there are more other types of kernel tests and so on. So I give you one style of test. Now let me move to a, a, a different style of test. So this is, uh, this is called the CRT, or the Conditional Randomization Test. And this is from this well-known paper called Panning for Gold, Model X Knockoffs for High-Dimensional con uh, Control Variable Selection by Candace Fan, Janssen, and Lee. This is the general Royal Society and their motivation is feature selection for regression. <coughs> so there, this is the generic setting there. X1 through XD are random variables and Y is um, uh, another. And we want to check if X1 is conditionally independent of Y, you want X2 to XD. Again, this is for feature selection. You want to see if the if X1 through XD are potential features uh, in a in a learning model, and maybe you're doing regret, you're doing some think lasso. The, the running example will lasso. You do lasso, try to do this, and then you get the lasso coefficients, right? And you want to see whether do you really need all of this, or can you knock some things, can you, and can you remove some of these things? So you can check. You want to check this kind of stuff. So that's the motivation. The assumption is the following here for the theory that we have exact anal exact knowledge of the joint distribution of x one. XD, I, this is known. And you have a box that can generate as many samples you as you want from this box. This is your assumption. Now, suppose T is a test statistic of, so what, it's some function of your samples X1 through XD and Y. For example, think of T as you do lasso, which is your L1 regularization. You're doing a lasso model to fit, uh, take X1 through XD and fit into Y. And then look at the uh, coefficient of x1, which lasso returns. Think of that as t. So I'm not even giving you a closed form expression today, I'm giving you a process, procedure by which t can, this g of the, uh, t can be computed from x1, uh, from a collection of samples x1 to xv and y. Are you with me so far? 
Now, what the, the idea here is the following. You know x1 to xd. So generate a sample x1 star from the conditional distribution of uh, 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 condition on x2 to xd. So if I give you an x2 to xd, I can generate a sample. I can, I can. Like I have a box which gives you samples from x1 to xd. So that box can also give you conditional distribution sample. This is the conditional distribution sample that I'm going to generate. X1 star. This has nothing to do with y. Remember, the conditioning is on x1 to x2 to x. Meaning, z is your dummy variable, right? You are generating a sample from this distribution. That's all I'm saying. This conditioning, following property is true. X1 star given x2 to xd and y has the same distribution as x1 given x2 to xd. Because y is anyway independent of x1 star. <laughs> Just put that in. Doesn't matter. Right? It, because y was the the idea, this is really the idea. If x1 and y are conditionally independent given x2 to xd, this is the key idea. Then the test statistic g with x1 to xd and y and the other test statistic g x1 star 2. I replace x1 by x1 star okay, and look at this quantity. Look at the test statistic when I actually have x1. They will be identically distributed for every value. So this is the key thing that, that I replace x1 by the right conditional distribution to x1 star. If nothing changes, then x1 isn't really having any effect. This is the intuition. Okay. So the key observation is that under the null hypothesis that they are meaning they are condition independent, this and this are <coughs> identically distributed. This is this is like the KCIT, the first part of it. We are saying some two distributions have some right asymptotic distribution. So what do you do? Well, simulate a large X1 star. How will you operationalize this? I'll, I have my box. I'll pull many, many samples of X1 star. Okay. Um, then for each one, I will solve the lasso problem. Which means I'll construct simulated test statistics. And then compute the test statistic for the real X1. And see where it falls. Compute the P, do the P test. Again, the guarantees are what it is. Okay, I think the guarantees are about this, not about the actual. So the, again, based on a population property under the null hypothesis, uh, that the original and simulated test statistics are identical. Dealing with finite samples, you need to think about all those other issues. The second is this one. So I, I, this is not the heart of the paper. This is one. This is where it starts. Okay, I just wanted to say that. The problem, of course, is computationally this is very heavy. With each for each new sample, you need to solve a new lasso to compute the test statistic. So they actually have some something based on knockoffs, which I didn't want to talk, which is computationally much lighter um, than what we are doing. Um, but the power with knockoffs is somewhat worse, but um, it, that's really the, the, the core of the paper. So I'm I just I, I won't even summarize what their main contributions. But I'm giving you a sense of the idea. But please do read the paper. So, they, as I said, the focus of this second phase, last part of the lecture, is not to give you an idea of every single algorithm, but the styles of algorithms that are around, so that you can go off and look at it. Third, another another way of doing things is so-called permutation-based method. There's a bunch of them. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this paper, Model Power Conditional Independence Test from NeurIPS 2017. Um, I was a co-author on this paper. So the, the setting for this, so let me describe how permutation, but permutation tests are built on the following older, uh, well, previous idea. I, do, I don't even know that it goes back well before this. It is the following. If I give you x, x comma y, um, I give you date, forget about condition dependence. Let's just talk about permutation test for independence. I give you x comma y from some joint distribution. I give you n, n I give you, I give you samples of a joint x comma y. And I ask whether they, these are independent or not. The following property should be true. I take this data set, break it into two parts. 
take one half of it, keep it x comma y. For the second half, look at x, commute y, and put it back together. You permute what? Two y's. Oh. Okay. So let's say there are hundred samples. Uh, there are two hundred samples. I'll break it up into two pairs of two lists of hundred samples. In the first set of samples, I'll keep x comma y in the table as as. Mm -hmm. Second is a set of samples, there's x and permute of y. It means random arbitrarily shuffle the y's touching the x. So x1 is matched to some random y in y tilde, yj. Basically, I'm doing a random bipartite matching between x and y. The important property is that the join this the marginals of x and y in both are the same, but in the second one is product form, in the first it isn't. So you should be able to separate these. If if these two look the same, then the first one also must have product. Okay. Roughly, that's that's roughly a permutation. I'm giving you the flavor of a permutation style test. So what we did was one a, a, a permutation test for condition. That's really the contribution of our game. So so let me let me go through this this idea. Okay. So x, y, and z are. Uh, under the null hypothesis, the same condition independence. Under the active hypothesis, they are not condition independence. And we are given 3n IID samples. Under the null hypothesis CI, okay, the joint distribution has the following factorization. Because X and Y are condition independent given C. And under the active, they are, they are. We are going to assume smoothness conditions. Okay, I'm being very cavalier here and even writing it. So Z is a continuous random variable that is smooth both in the marginal and the conditional. And this is actually not explicitly written in terms of the Lipschitz, but through some eigenvalue of a feature information matrix, which essentially again is a smoothness condition. And so it, it's it's implicitly that. So it, it's really uh, is assuming smoothness, just written in a different way. But really what I want to focus on is how permutation tests are done. So the NSAM, so you take your data set, multiply, break it up into three parts. Let's call it U1, U2, U3. It's like these three columns, right? X, Y, Z, three columns. Leave this as is, X and Y. In this one, do a nearest neighbor bootstrap. Meaning, look at the first row of this column. This is the value of Z1. In this, find the closest Z to this one in L2 now. So somewhere here, there are different z's. There is one z that is very close. That, that's the closest. Very close or not is questionable, but there is some z that is the closest. So that is the close. Let's call that that is the nearest neighbor for this one. Clear what I, I just found this thing. Then what we do is take this value, this value, this value, and that's my new data. Here. Yeah. Similarly, then go to the second line, to a nearest nearby profile. Maybe the same one. There's correlations now. Now the whole independence is broken. Okay. Take this one, maybe the same one. Maybe not. In any case, take this one, take this one, take this one. That's your second data. Go through this list. Okay. The process is clear. So what you have at this point are two data sets. Um, um, X y prime z is what you have in this process and if z were equal to z prime then u till u prime would have this problem they are not there are two issues this is not true and independence is not true but if u and u prime were um, u and u prime were if z were equal to z prime this would be true in the irrespective of whether hypothesis 0 or hypothesis 1 is true. So let phi be the joint distribution of x, y, and z uh, such that u prime is sampled uh, from this whatever distribution I'm constructing. Because it's, um, PCI is a true conditional distribution. It can be argued that for n large enough, phi, and, yeah, phi is close to P, uh, the condition dependence distribution. Um, and you can actually characterize sort of the TV distance. I can go back to my favorite TV distance. Everything is smooth, so I can, I'm happy. I can stick to whatever notion of distances I want. Um, so you can characterize the error between them. 
um, in terms of number of samples that can be proved. So what, but takeaway right now is so far we have n samples, IAD, under P, and n samples, non, not IAD, they are, they are correlated because we are reaching the same pool. But they should be weakly, they should be weak correlated because if you have a begin of pool and reaching into it, then they shouldn't really, hopefully you would not have too many correlates. Um, X, Y, Z, under P. And P is sort of like SCI. So these are technical issues that you need to be, you need to deal with, but fine, whatever, we can deal with that. What you do is, you got these two data sets, label samples in the first one as one, label samples from the second one as zero. So these samples are n nearly condition independent samples, we know that. This one, we don't know whether they are condition independent or not. Intuition is that. They're all, under the null hypothesis, these two data sets should have essentially the same distribution. Under the, under the non-null hypothesis, they have very different distributions. So, we want to, so, this is again a, a property, a population property. Anyway, let me be very, let me be explicit since I've been saying that. And you need to rely on smoothness. Now, if you want to give any guarantees, you need to actually rely on smoothness. The previous the ones I talked about, in some implicit sense, here we explicitly have to rely on it uh, uh, because we are going to try to give finite, we are going to give some concentration. So what do you do? You split the data set into train and test. Okay. So you've got these two bags, two, uh, these two things, right? Uh, so you split into train and test and train a binary classifier. classifier basically. And the intuition is if they, now you look at, now you test on it. If the test is giving you a chunk, that means they're the same. If the test is actually separating them, that means they're different. So you're using a classifier, you're using somebody else's black box to solve your problem. So what the real contribution here is to convert a CI test to a classifier. And the motivation for us was the following, uh, when, we, when we did this. Classifiers, the state of the art classifier is improving tremendously. We, we, so we wanted to write on that code. Uh, you, you don't want a better, instead of designing improved and improved tests, you want to say, if you have better and better classifiers, you want to immediately pull guarantees from that and say they're better. So the guarantees here really inherit the guarantees of the best classifier. So the theorem statement will be of the form, suppose the classifier can do this, then we do this kind of concentration. And then make the problem of classifier somebody else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, so let, to just finish the story, so we can use this classifier and compute the usual empirical risk. So the implication, the result, and this is very sloppily result uh, written uh, because I've written with high probability under assumption under the consensus. But yeah, uh, under the null hypothesis, this risk will be close to 0.5, and with high, this this thing basically means there's a high enough probability statement floating around somewhere. And under the null hypothesis, this risk will be less than 0.5 times some distance between P and P uh, into, the, into total variation. So you can, because this, everything is smooth, we can stick to the PV stuff. And the bigger the distances, the bigger the gap between these two is. And that will reflect in the finite sample. There are, so one key assumption, which is sort of, uh, which I don't even talk about it is, is you need to, for giving these kinds of guarantees, Clearly, you need to make some assumption of how good the classifier is. The classifier is junk, you can't give these kinds of things. So this, so that the binary classifier is such that the function class is rich enough, is needed. Okay. Because it, it should be rich enough to actually capture whatever functions you're trying to separate. And so this is in terms of some distance from the, the base optimal classifier. And those kinds of parameters will come into this. So, Again, the point of this was not to give a detailed algorithm, but to give sort of different styles of algorithm that are useful. And in uh, empirically, many of these things are used in practice. All three of these methods are used in practice. And I wanted to talk about yet another, but since I'm, I, I ran out of steam by the end of this thing, I did a paper which I would strongly, two things I just want to say, if you're interested in this stuff, is the following two things I didn't have time to talk about. Which is foresight. This is a paper by Azatia and Chatterjee. 
It's a very, very nice non-parametric way of, again, uh, doing tests. This is a recent paper. Uh, with, uh, at some point, I'll try to put up notes, and if I do, I'll send it via copy, and you can update maybe this. And if you want empirical path, another thing I did not talk about is actually time series as well. Uh, so if you want to go to actually testers for time series, um, Tikramite is actually a really nice package uh, by Jacob Ringa et al. So again, I would cite, uh, I would refer you to, if you want to, even though I didn't talk about time series and causality and CI testing in time series, this is something you should do. So for, I guess, dynamical systems and stuff, it's maybe something interesting if you want to do. So that brings me to the end of this uh, uh, thing. I know towards the end, I've become very, very, uh, 